Pastor Eugene and Pastor John has been doing an awesome job on the sermon series from the book of Revelation, and they titled it Alpha and Omega, meaning the first, the last, the beginning and the end. Uh, in Hebrews 12 and 2, um, she don't have that on the screen, but that's okay. It says, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. And if you missed uh, a few services, I'm just going to kind of go with this little quick review. Uh, Pastor Eugene started off on the book of Revelations, chapter 1 and 2. And Pastor Eugene talked about Jesus being the son of man and how he ministered to the seven churches and kept them on track by his spirit. And not only do he want to keep the churches on track with his spirit, he also wants to minister to, to us by his spirit so we can stay on track. Amen? Amen. And so, because Pastor Eugene said that he doesn't just want to be our Savior, he wants to be our Lord. Then last week they talked about Jesus being the Lamb of God. Chapter 5, Revelation, uh, John, he wept, and he wept bitterly because there was no one worthy to open up the scroll. No one was good enough. But then one of the elders said, don't cry, John. Worthy is the Lamb of God to be slain and taken away the sins of the world. He proven himself to be provider and protector for the saints. How I many you know it's the Lamb who secures the future of the believer? It is the Lamb that secures the future of the believers. I met a friend by the name of Jeff Dukes about five or six years ago. And Jeff was an awesome coach. And uh, he told me, he said, if you're ever in Orlando and you want to go to the theme park Disney, he said, give me a call. Give me a call because Jeff was high. And, uh, he was a high, had a high position in Disney at one time. He said, just give me a call. So we was getting ready to go to Disney, a lot of my family members. So I called Jeff. He said, man, I'm going to be out in Orlando. Told him the day. He said, man, hey, I'll be in town. Just come. Let me know what time you're going to come. Hey, and I'll get you in. He said, I get, up five, I get five of your family members in. I was like, wow. Man, Disney is high. I'm talking about a two-day pass. That's, that's about six, $700. Easy. So Carl Jeff got out there. We embraced one another. He said, come on, follow me. Everybody was getting their tickets. He said, no, no, you don't need to go this way. You need to go there. My cousin was there. She was there. Appreciate you. And, uh, and, she, and we all went over there, my five guests. And Jeff, I don't know what he done, but we went to this special game. He, he gave him some kind of little pass. And, and the guy said, okay, and he walked through, and I was next, and I just said, I'm with him. And then, uh, and then my wife, she's smart, she said, I'm with him. And so then my daughters and my mother, they came in, and all five of us went, and said, we, we, we were him. And so we embraced, he said, you got access to all the parts, all three parts. He said, call me tomorrow, same time, and we'll go, and we'll do the same thing. I said, man, I preach like you, man, and so forth. I mean, we just had a great time. And so what you're saying? I'm saying that if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you made him Savior and Lord, and you get to the pearly gates, and they ask you why you should get in, you don't need to say, well, I didn't do this, and I didn't do that. You don't need to be saying that, well, I, I worked on the hands and feet committee. Uh, I went to a fellowship. You. No, 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 no. You don't need all you need to say is, I'm with him. That's all you do. Don't mess it. All you need to say is, I'm with him. Let's practice that. I'm with him. Oh, We're we going to get to heaven. Cause we gonna, and, and don't be saying that, my God, I show enough better than the ones that you just let in there. Oh, no, no. Don't say, don't say that. You just say, I'm with him. Everybody say, I'm with him. That's how we're going to get in. Because we with him. We with him. And so, uh, this week we're going to talk about Jesus being the groom. Revelations from Revelations 19, 1 through 9. I'm going to be reading from the English version. If you have your Bibles, I think she's going to throw that on the screen. From Revelations 19, 1 through 9. It says, Rejoice in heaven. After this I heard what seems to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, See, they rejoiced in heaven, and they cried out. And I want y'all to kind of, because we're going to practice. We're going to practice what they're doing in heaven. Everybody say hallelujah. Everybody say hallelujah. 
Oh, y'all doing good. Y'all going, we're going to mess around and have some church in here. And so, so we, we just practicing. Y'all already got, got it down on with him. So we just going to practice on the hallelujah because that's what they're doing. There's a lot of praise going on in heaven. And so then they said salvation and glory and power belongs to God for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupt the earth with her immortality and has avenged on her the blood of his saints. Once more they cried out, everybody say hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying amen. Everybody say hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying praise our God. All you servants who hear, who fear him is small and great. Then I heard what seems to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of a mighty pearl of thunder crying out. Everybody say hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the mighty reigns. Let, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. It was granted her the clothe, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true words of God. The angel is giving John a tour about what's trans forming in heaven in the last days. And they rejoiced over five things. And five of those things was, one was heaven rejoiced because of the full salvation that came to God's people. Not justification or sanctification, but the final aspect, glorification of the saints. And the kingdom along with the glory and the power that belongs to God, the saints, the glorified, we're justified by faith. Then we go through the sanctification process. And then the last day, we're going to be glorified. And then he said, because final justice will be meted out, because rebellion is ended, because God is in control, the marriage of the Lamb is complete. For these few minutes that we have, we're going to talk about the marriage of the Lamb. It says in the seventh verse, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. We mentioned why John was seeing and hearing the celebration and what was going on in heaven. Let me tell you something, no matter what's going on in your life, hell or high water, the bad, the good, and the ugly, you got a right to celebrate. You got a right to celebrate because you know what? His victory is our victory. You know why? Because we with him. We with him. Amen. I said, we with him. And it says, for the marriage of the lamb has come. And marriage is an important mo motif in scripture. It is imagery and quite used often in scripture. Jesus portrayed as the lamb, but now the lamb assumes the role of the, of the groom. Can you imagine how long Jesus has been waiting for this day to come? God ordained Jesus he picked a bride for his son called the church before there even was a church. In the Old Testament, they had something called betrothals or engagements, and there was a long periods of time. And these agreements were made before the children was even of age to be married. So there was years of preparation. Jesus, God had preparation for Jesus' bride from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. That was a long time. So you can see why they're excited about this thing finally coming to pass. It says, and the bride has made herself ready. The bride has made herself ready through the work, not of her own, but of Christ. He the one purged her from all sin and purity. She is a flawless, blameless, unblemished virgin because of Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians, and use this analogy in Ephesians 5, 25 and 27. Kind of symbolizing it with a husband and a wife. He said, husbands, love your wives, 
as Christ loved the church and gave herself for gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, have cleansed her by the washing of the water with the with the word, so that he might present the church to himself a splendor, without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing that he that she might be holy and without blemish. Second Corinthians eleven and two, right Paul. Paul writes a same scenario. He says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you a pure virgin to Christ. How many know Christ cannot be separated from the church? The church has been blood washed and blood ball. Christ cannot separate himself from the church. He sanctified us. He's making us holy. And when he come, and because he poured himself, that white pure and that purple is royalty, couldn't find red for blood, so I went with the next best thing. Now you tell me, you got some skills. Y'all better get this because I'm making a mess. Please get this. Separate that. You a bad person if you can separate this. It's mixed in there. Christ in the church. You cannot separate them. You cannot separate Christ from the church. You cannot separate him from the body of his believers. You can't separate that. So my brothers and sisters, I don't care who you get mad at and what you got mad for. Don't let the devil trick you and separate you from the body of Christ. This is the church right now. This ain't just it's the gym, but it, it ain't about the gym. It's about us, the body of Christ. And there's so many people have got hurt in church and are bitter and have separated themselves from the body of Christ. You can't separate yourself. Don't do it. Don't do it. You ain't complete. You ain't complete. The body ministers to one another. And even when we take communion, they say some people are sick because what? We don't respect the body. The church, the body of Christ, not just building, not just fellowship. I'm talking about the body of Christ, all believers. Don't you separate yourself from believers because somebody hurt you or somebody misunderstood you. The devil is a lie because the Bible says he's a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. He wants to devour you. And let me tell you something. I tell my Sunday school class and I told the kids the other day, let me tell you something, stick with the body. Stay within the bunch. Because I'm not that smart, but I know this. The banana that gets separated from the bunch is the, the banana that's about to get peeled. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave that one. I'm going to leave that one alone. Uh, 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 let, me, let, let, me, let me get on to my lesson. For, for, and, and it said, the fine linen that the bride is clothed is the vision that represents the righteous acts of the saints. At salvation, believers were clothed with Christ's righteousness. It was imputed to them. You can find that in Romans 3, 21, 24. We're not going to read that for time purpose, but I am going to read a shorter verse, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. But it's also in Romans 3, 21 and 24 if you're taking notes. But in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, in the, in the e, uh, ESV version, for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin. So in him we might become the righteousness of God. But after believers are glorified, after you go to, through the justification and the sanctification, now the glorification, God's righteousness is no longer imputed to us. We're blessed and we become the pure righteousness of God. First John 3, 2 and 3 says, Beloved, 
We are God's children now. And when we will be not, I'm sorry, beloved, we are God's children now. And when we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who trusts and have hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. We're becoming the righteousness of God as we allow him to be Lord of our lives and put him first. And I know it's tough, but the Holy Spirit is the comforter and it helps us and it aids us and it assists us. You got supernatural power. I'm not superstitious, but I believe in the supernatural. Anybody believe in the supernatural? For you to be sitting in that pew. Oh, there's some supernatural things that God had to intervene, amen, to get us here. Come on, somebody. Birth from a virgin. All these things. If you don't believe in the supernatural, you might as well close the book. When God doesn't change my situation, and God can change me, that's supernatural. But I love for him to change the situation. But when God work on me and change my heart about the situation, that's supernatural. That's not my strength. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. That's not my righteousness. That's the righteousness of God. My righteousness is that filthy rags. His righteousness, because I'm trying to do it his way, is his righteousness. I can't take no credit for that. He's just good, good, camel soup good. That preacher crazy, but I like him. <laughs> and then it says right here, the ninth verse, and the angel said to me, bless, write this, bless are those who invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. One thing I'm so glad about, it won't be no haters in heaven. There won't be no haters in heaven. Everybody's going to be loving on. That's why we got to get our hearts right. Ain't going to be no haters. You know, Matthew, you don't just write it down, but it's not going to be on the screen. She's not going to put up anything. But in Matthew 22, I was reading, and I asked my wife to get it for me because it's a, a story about the king inviting everybody to the wedding. And he gets everybody into the wedding. Long story. But one verse talks about when they get to the wedding, because he invited everybody, he looks at this guy, the king, walking around looking at all the guests, and he, he noticed the guy that didn't have on the proper garments. And he said, hey, friend, how you get in here without the proper wedding garments? And the guy was speechless. And the king said, bind him up, hand and feet. Get him out of here. He threw him in everlasting darkness. And it says that many are invited, but few are chosen. He didn't have the proper wedding garments. He didn't have, he wasn't God. You just can't bogart your way into heaven. You just can't bogart your way into this wedding. Now, now, back in the day, I don't even think they do this anymore. But if you ever been in a wedding, and you know, sometimes the people that's getting married hadn't had the purest life, you know, you know things that they, they didn't do it God's way, and kind of had some bumps in the road. So they're getting married, it's a beautiful wedding, all the guests there, and the preacher says this right here that kind of makes everybody heart go, and, and he, he kind of said something like this, maybe paraphrase. He said that uh, if there's any one that objects and can show just cause why this couple cannot lawfully be joined together, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. And if your back turned like that, you don't know who back there. <laughs> And if you're, the wedding, if you're in the wedding, you're like, preacher, hurry up and get this over with because you don't know. I got something. It might be YouTube. <laughs> you don't know what might happen. So you'd be like, hurry up and get that part up. Well, you ain't got to worry about that in this, in this wedding. Ain't gonna, there's not going to be any haters. John 3 and 29 says, 
The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. The friend of the bridegroom, we friends. We should be happy for one another. If God bless you before he bless me, I'm already blessed. But if, you, if I'm praying for God and I'm in a tough situation and then God do something about your situation, I'm going to rejoice with them to rejoice. Come on, somebody, because we brothers, we all in this together. We all with him. And so I got to be happy for you. You got to be happy for me. We got to be happy for one another. And so there's not going to be any haters in heaven. And I just want to say this. I don't know. Uh, I just kind of wrote this down for good measure. It says weddings are a, divide, a, delight, a delightful event because they represent the joy and the hope that love promises. I don't know about you, but I, I still remember the, the first time I called myself in love. My first girlfriend, way, way back. Now, this one I got now, she's still my girlfriend, but we've been together, what, 36, 37 years? Yeah, she's still my girlfriend. Though. We're married, I'm just saying, she's, we still, we, we've been married 30 some years. But my first one, I won't forget her neither. I mean, boy, she rocked my world. I was like in the sixth, maybe sixth, seventh grade. You know, and I, I wrote this little note, then no, back, this back in the 70s. But my little game was, hey, if you like me, check this box. <laughs> that was my rap. You like me, check this box. I sent a little, she checked the little box. I like you too. Yes. But my whole world changed. I started earning my pants. I started brushing my hair. But I took my mama little, what they call it, little eyebrow pistol. I was working with this peach fuzz, boy. I was trying to get it. My mama said, boy, what's wrong with you? Nothing, nothing. My, she asked my daddy, what's wrong with that boy? He didn't change. Uh, he didn't found some little girl he like. Oh, that's what's going on. I mean, she, I mean, and when that girl quit me, when somebody else showed me that she wrote her, wrote her note and she said, I like them too, my little heart melted for about three days. <laughs> Maybe about a week. Cause my daddy kept saying, I didn't understand, he said, it ain't nothing but puppy love. They ain't nothing, anybody heard that? They ain't nothing but puppy love. But it was so real to the puppy. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that love was real. And some of y'all did too. Because sometimes, you know, you so in love with that puppy love, anybody ever said, loves me, she loves me not, loves me. So they said, they don't, they don't care about you like you think they do. You love me. Yes, they do. She love me not. She love me. She love me now. I'm doing this real fast. She love me. She love me not. You're going to make it work. It's a win-win situation. You're going to make it work. Because if you get to the last step, and I said, he loves me not, you're going to say, oh, he loves me. End of story. Just, just end of story. He loves me. But if, let me close, if puppy love, I mean, puppy love messed me up. I mean, we was on the phone because we didn't have cell phones back then. And we didn't have cordless phones. We had them cords with the long wire. With the cord, you all in the bed. You hang up. No, you hang up. Hang that phone up, boy. You be like, sleep still on the phone. Just messed up. My point is, if puppy love messed me up like that, what you think agape love is supposed to do? What you think agape love, an unconditional love? Jesus has an unconditional love for us. It's not puppy love. It's real love. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 28, another scenario about a husband and a wife. It says, in the same way husbands should love their wives, as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. John 3, 16, so God so loved, not just the world. That's universal. But when I found out that God so loved me, God so loved me, that he gave his only begotten son, that's whoever believe in one would not perish but have everlasting life, as messed up as I was, I didn't even have to try to make it work. He just told me this, just like he's telling you, all your ups and downs and your struggles. He say, I love you. I love you. You ain't got to even try to make it work. I love you. I love you. I love you. No, God, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't do right. I didn't, that's all right, just repent. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. You ain't got to juice it up. You ain't got to try to, you, you ain't got to do all, none of that. He just loves you. There's no knot in him. He just loves you. He just loves you. Nathan's group is going to come. And you know what? I just want to, like Pastor Paul would always say, I don't know where you at with God. I, 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 I don't know. I just assume. But he loves you because he wants you to spend eternity with him. And so, if you don't know him for the part of your sins, if you ain't with him, and even if you've been in the church, you've been around the church, or you're not in the church, this is a good time to become a part of the church. To be in him, to be with him, to have a relationship with him. That's what it's all about. He loves you. But the question is, do you love him? And will you accept his love? Well, it'd be a great day for somebody to say, I do. Ooh. I mean, I mean, this is kind of like a, like a, like a, like when, when, when they get on the big screen and want to get somebody married, married and they propose, God's proposing to you. All you got to do is say, I do. I do. Right down the big screen. You know, heaven, angels waiting. The Bible said that angels rejoice when one sinner gives their life to Christ. Not only will angels rejoice, we'll rejoice with you. Because now you with him. You about to spend eternity with him. Because he loves you. And you saying, God, help me to love you back. Lord, I thank you and I praise you, God, Lord, for this opportunity to stand before your people, precious people that you died for, along with myself. I pray, God, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of anyone that needs you, that they would come to this altar, talk to you, tell you all about it, the hurt, the pain. Even some of them, I love you as Savior, but I'm struggling with you for being my Lord. But God, I want you back in my life. I want you in my life. I want you to rule my life. I want to be with you. I want to put on the right garments, the right attitude, the right character. And I can only do that through the power of the Holy Ghost. You bless them and you touch them right now. This altar is open for anyone that wants to. Nathan, y'all lead us into worship.